Hello, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today is the 8th of June, and we had a very interesting week last week in terms of movements in all asset classes, and we are probably going to have an even more interesting week next week. Let's see what happened last week very quickly. Before non-farm payroll on Friday, we had jolts and ADP, and everything came in slightly weaker, showing that the economy was moderating and all asset classes really liked it. Well, on Friday, we got a shock in terms of non-farm payrolls because that was about 80,000, 90,000 stronger than expectations. And yet the unemployment rate went up to 4%. Now that is quite possible. The unemployment rate can go up if more people come into the workforce. And that is, that is not something which is particularly troubling. What, is, what was troubling for me was the fact that it's all part-time jobs as opposed to full-time jobs. But even that does not explain how the bond market reacted. I think it's, as a word of explanation, what I think happened is that everyone was positioned the wrong way, looking for a softer report in line with the AD with the ADP and the jolts, and in fact, they got the opposite result, and we have naturally the FOMC next week and the big auctions. So the market was caught extremely flat-footed, and we had a complete debacle in the bond market where the long end fell two and a half points, and the short end went up 16 basis points in the twos. So we are now set up for what is going to be a very important week for macro positioning as when we come out of this week this next week we will know far better how to position ourselves and what to look for the next several months andy what do you think we're going to get next week well i'll just make some comments on last week first obviously there was a market reaction earlier in the week as data came in weak and it's the first time we saw a uh, weak growth data gdp now fell to i think 1.6% or something like that which estimates the current gdp by the end of the week it had bounced to 3.5% so we saw what i would deem a growth scare and what's interesting about that is in a growth scare, the first thing that happens is bonds rally a lot. And they did. What didn't happen, which always happens in a growth scare, is equities didn't fall, credit spreads didn't widen. So the bond market took it as a growth scare while the equity market shrugged which that shouldn't be a surprise and that happens all the time, but we'll see what happens when an actual growth slowdown occurs. But while Nick, I think rightly says that uh, people were flat footed on the number and the auctions coming up and big news of the week, I would say the bond market, the, the jobs not market, though the unemployment rate went up to 4%, I think when you step back and look at the average hourly earnings, the hours worked and the increase in the non-farm payroll numbers, you get something that has um, been corroborated with when looking at data from the U.S. government about how much income is being withheld from paychecks. And every time money is withheld from a paycheck, the Treasury gets it. And so they count it and tell us what it is. And that number was extremely hot all leading up to the NFP. And the NFP was showing hourly, average hourly earnings, meaning wages, was above expectations. Jobs were more plentiful than expectations. And hours worked stayed stable. Indicates that incomes are very strong. There's no two ways about it when looking at the UR to, to even though that went up to 4% from 3.9, there's no two ways about it. That number was strong, showing income strength, which has really supported the economy. So I think that puts the Fed in a pickle. 
And I think this is where Nick and I are 100 percent on the same page. They are in a pickle. And what we will have happen is on Monday, we'll have a whole bunch of three-year notes auction. Tuesday, a whole bunch of 10-year notes auction. Wednesday morning, we'll get the CPI. And the Fed will be meeting Tuesday and Wednesday and announce at 2 p.m. what they plan on doing and tell us what their projections are for uh, growth, inflation, the Fed funds rates in what they call the uh, summary of economic projections or the dot plot. And they're going to get the CPI ahead. And so that's going to create some flux in that. But I think when we look at that, and we'll be putting out a a chart that we'll uh, email you at some point next week that shows the potential dot plot revisions. But one thing I think is for sure is a hot CPI number, whatever the dot plot shows, it's unlikely we get any hikes bef- cuts before the election. It's possible that we don't get any hikes cuts at all in 2024 if the number is hot. And if the number is cold, the Fed wants to cut and there's not that much time left. We've got they're not going to cut to, to, on Wednesday. They only have July and September before the election and then they only have two more meetings. So they're almost certainly going to Worst case, in terms of num- the highest number of cuts that the market's going to see on Wednesday with a cold CPI, they're going to hold at two cuts. And so that's going to be the dynamic that we're going to be dealing with during the week. Yeah. So let's see what I think. And I always start from myself. If I was a member of the FOMC, what would I be putting down in the dot plots? What would be my own projections? I have to tell you that I have no idea. It all depends on the data that I see on Wednesday morning, which is the CPI. We are, as Andy correctly said, we are running out of meetings. We have the June meeting, nothing. Then we have July. Then we have September, which I think is off the table simply because it's the one before the election. And I don't think that the Fed wants to be seen as political at all. And then we have the one the day after the election and then the one in December. So we are running out of time to have any cuts. I could not in good faith pencil in on a hot CPI more than one cut in 2024. I might punt the cut out into 2025. We all know what the Fed is like. The Fed is a governmental institution and they and all government institutions love inertia. If they have an excuse to punt something into a later date, they will take it. And why not? How can they how can anyone possibly argue with collecting more data and being more cautious? Nobody can argue with that. And that is what they are concerned about. They don't want to be seen as not fighting inflation. I think we we can all, I wouldn't say gather, but I would say instinctively feel that the Fed is not going to push inflation all the way down to two and a half to uh, 2%. It would be quite happy with 2.2, 2.3, 2.4 core and call it a victory. That to me says that the whole cutting cycle in 2024 to 2025 is going to be shallower. I can't see a terminal rate that is going to be past 4%. I can't see it into the threes very much. So I think that a total of about five cuts throughout 2024 to 2025 is all we can hope for. And that gives us some ideas about what to do if the number is hot and what to do if the number is cold. And I will go through those alternatives in my part later on and give you some ideas where we're going to be bidding and offering uh, and why, most importantly. But what it also tells me is that we've been very correct in keeping a lot of money in cash earning 530, 540, and not being drawn into buying the longer tenures as yet. I think that unless the number is cold, 
that will continue. Bonds are in a trading range at the moment, and we are looking to buy and sell the extremes. That's all we're doing. And I don't think the Fed is going to give us any more information that we, than we have at the moment. But what will give us information is the CPI number. Yes, indeed. So as Nick said, there's going to be levels to buy two-year notes on a hot number because it seems unlikely to me that they will, unless inflation really accelerates, which I don't think is going to happen, that they're going to hike. But if you assume that, the next two years they don't hike, okay? What will you earn on your cash? What would you earn on it? What would your break even be on a two year? Well, essentially it would be what you're getting today, which is about 5.33% on your money markets. The two year off, if it were to get a hot number, may offer, I think it will, offer as much as 510 in yield. At that level, you're giving up 23 basis points in interest for the life of the investment. That seems like a no-brainer to us. And so we're going to be looking at deploying any short-term cash in two-year notes at that point. The question then becomes what to do with equities. And equities are going to respond as you might expect. They have been responding as you might expect. When the Fed is perceived to be dovish, they buy tech. When the Fed is perceived to be hawkish, they don't sell tech, but they do sell other equities. So for now, given that reaction to markets, we like our exposure in equities in that we have S&P calls. Those represent some tech, pretty good amount, 30% tech, um, and limited downside if they sell the rest of the market. And we have a core position in XLK, which is, it's interesting. NVIDIA is fluffy on the stock split that gets executed this coming Monday and could retrace. But in the event of a cold number, they're going to rally that. So it seems like a and in a, an event of a, a hot number, our calls are going to expire, which is fine because we are not going to take the downside of owning actual equities. So I think we're well positioned at this stage. Again, looking to extend only at duration, only at reasonable yields, and then letting the data tell us where we're going. Yeah. One thing where we haven't mentioned actually is the ECB, which cut rates this week. And the press conference, as expected by the market, was hawkish insofar as they said, don't expect us to cut again unless the data says so. That was all expected by the market. What was not expected by me was the reference to real rates. Uh, Lagarde said basically that real rates around these levels are, and I'm summarizing here because this is not exactly what she said, but this is what transpires that she effectively says, is that they don't want real rates to go any higher than they are at the moment. And real rates at the moment are around the 210, 215 area in 220, whatever, in, in the US. The high has been 250 or 255, I remember because I bought it. So 255 has been the high in real rates, and now they are 20, 30 basis points lower. What that tells me is that the central banks are afraid that if, they, uh, if the market takes real rates much higher than they are at the moment, that something could break. And they are going to try to keep them at these levels. That tells me that duration, I mean, fixed income in terms of duration is unattractive. Uh, why buy? I just don't understand why buy, people would buy tens and thirties at these levels until the data tells you to buy them. It tells me that is unattractive. I'd much rather have a real yield, i.e. tips. So we are correctly positioned, I feel, in fixed income. We have a very small proportion in TLT, 
which is a hedge. It, to me, it's just an option if something were to fall apart and we're not fast enough into extending our duration. That hasn't been the case. So to me, that's a hedge and that's fine. If you don't want, if you don't need the hedge, you don't need the TLT. Much better to have the, the tips because they provide a hedge as well and they're higher yielding. So that is the situation. I think our portfolio is pretty much perfect until we get some further news, which we will get from from the FOMC most probably and probably from CPI. And then we'll be able to send you an email and tell you how we're changing it and most importantly, why we're changing it. Sounds good. Excellent. Look forward to sending you an email next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Our portfolio was essentially unchanged last week, uh, although the NAV did come down to 301.5 from 303 over. And that really was because of gold. I get the feeling that gold is now going to <clears throat> fall about 100 bucks because I have a bad feeling about CPI next week, and I think bonds are going to have a bad time. But that is good for us, okay? And let's have a look at the order entry. I think as soon as the two-year gets to 505, we will email you. We've sold the two-year note for one cut in 2024 and four cuts in 2025, which is really as bearish as the market can be. And that comes out at 508 break-even. So we think that if we can get 508 on the two-year note, we will be ecstatic because something will break after that and we will make a lot of money. But we will definitely send you an email by Wednesday. Otherwise, just so that all the performances weekly, monthly and the broker statements naturally are updated both for the daily and as you can see for the monthly for the month of May. So everything is there. We are happy with these allocations because they provide us with a lot of optionality and a lot of room to react on what is going to be a very important week that might well decide us to change these allocations quite substantially. And before I go, just a quick mention of the poll. Thank you very much for completing it. So 49% the overwhelming majority want an increase in the AUM to 1 million. I just want you to be aware that does entail more activity and more options activity and more activity in general via emails and more trading, more limit orders, basically a greater engagement from you. So if that is not something that you voted for, although you did vote for the increase, please just send me an email or put it in the comments because we are now actually thinking of doing two portfolios, i.e. retaining the one at 300,000 without using options and adding a 1 million one where we would be using more advanced trading strategies and where you would probably need to have a futures account as well or be willing to learn some trading strategies from us as we go along in time. So that is what we are thinking. Two portfolios, probably starting in September because people are on holiday now. One at 300,000 and another one at 1 million, which will involve more activity and more engagement from the account holder. So please drop me a line, tell me if we are along the right lines, if we are satisfying your needs and how you would suggest that we proceed. Thank you very much indeed and speak to you next week.